over my dead body. I'm not going. You can do what I like. Now, a lot of people refuse to go. Right? If you don't go, they take your furniture out of your house, put it on the pavement. Now you've got to go look out for yourself. Totally crazy. So I remember it very well. I remember the bulldozers came, saw all the things that happened. Guys running around, taunting the police. They had to run for their lives. I remember when some of the riots took place in those days, but people only protested. They shot two of our youngsters in the back. Meet Palebo, a digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. Welcome back to the Radio Vagabond and Cape Town. My name is Palebo, and in this episode, we're going driving. I've learned on my trip that some of the best people to talk about what it's like in a city are Uber drivers. So in this episode, we're gonna do just that. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. A lot of Uber drivers here in Cape Town are from other countries. Three of the four I speak to in this episode are from other countries. Congo, Malawi, and first, Philip from Rwanda. He's got a cool Rasta haircut with dreadlocks, and he's lived eight years here in Cape Town. Yeah. Okay. yeah so now I'm just driving the Uber. I used to driving the text before, and the Uber came, and I joined the Uber, and then I see now that it's better life in the Uber. Yeah. yeah. And it's a, a cool car, a cool music, and cool hair you have. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm a Rasta. I like to shave clothes, and uh, I also like to smoke weed. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah that's my best thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the best thing about living in uh, Cape Town? Ah, uh, the best thing is to live in Cape Town and Cape Towny. But just only Cape Town, the city is no much climb. And uh, no much what? No much climb like uh, hijacking. No crime, crime. Yeah, 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 yeah. climb. And the uh, police in the city, if you lost it, they give uh, you ask you, they help you. And it's a clean city. It's a beautiful city, mountain and the beaches. So Cape Town is the best city. Yeah. And a lot of people they have the impression that in in Cape Town it's you get robbed, you get killed, uh, that it's a it's a violent place. That's what a lot of people think that it's dangerous here. Uh, about that is not. It depends where you are. So and it depends. It is everywhere in the world. So if you are in a CBD, around the city, you will never have any problem. But if you are in a township, where like those uh, people like uh, Scott is staying, and yeah, of course you're gonna get a step and you're gonna get a lot. Yeah, and, and and use your common sense. Don't walk down a dark alley in the middle of the night. Uh, yeah, you cannot. But you cannot walk in the in the night in those areas. But in the town, people are partying from. From morning until tonight, in the morning, right there on in the town, in the CBD. So in the town, if you stay in the town, you can walk anytime or anywhere you want, but not out of the town. My next Uber driver calls himself Anas, and like Philip, he's not from Cape Town. Uh, I'm not from Cape Town actually. Uh, I'm from uh, Congo. You're from Congo. Yeah, yeah. How long have you been here? I've been here just been six years now. Okay. Okay. Anna agrees with Philip that it's a peaceful place. Yes, uh, all over the world you find actually uh, people being robbed, killed, yeah. violence everywhere actually. Even in the US, in Australia, in England you find the same situations. Uh, maybe here there is an accent about that. But for peaceful I don't mean robbing or... Violent situation happening. I don't really mean that. I mean, according to where I'm coming from, you find civil war. Hmm. There is no peace in the country. Politics is very, very extremely dead. It's actually what uh, I meant about okay. a peacefully place. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's actually peacefully and yeah. robbery and kind of crime and stuff like that. You find it everywhere, and yeah. it's actually. <laughs> How the world is growing. He came here as a refugee. He wanted to get away from the civil war in Congo. Exactly. And, you know, even if you don't find all over the country, everywhere, the war going on, but some part of the country, like the east of our country, the south east, the west east, you find like people fleeing fighting rebels everywhere that also makes the country really 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 
uh, bring the country down. You mm. won't find opportunity, you won't find work, and it's all actually those reasons that you find we, we decide actually to, to come here. First of all, safety, and secondly, you find actually a very bad situation uh, for the economy, and yeah. very, very bad, yes. Yeah. So you you have a family here? I do. I do have I do have my family. I have my wife huh? with uh, two kids. Wow. Mm-hmm. How old are they? Uh, one is actually three years today, and one the second birthday one, today. Birthday today. Yes. Oh. They are busy celebrating. And you're but here driving me. Uh, <laughs> I said it's you know it's a kid uh, party. I first leave and maybe later on I uh, should go and join them and yeah, you yeah. know uh, we running actually <laughs> to <laughs> to improve our economy which is not really good to improve our life so yeah. party we spent and I need to go to join them after I make some <laughs> back yeah, yeah. again yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly well i will be well, with them con- later on yeah. con- congratulations <laughs> thank you lady. and one uh, for your question one uh it's also is also one week today so three years and one week <laughs> one week <laughs> one week yes we have oh. a, we have a baby of one week today <laughs> yeah. wow yeah getting back to philip I also asked him if there's something bad about being here. Ah, uh, the worst, the uh, worst things about living here is just about the price for the uh, accommodation, which is went up and like you can see like a one bedroom apartment to live, you pay like a five thousand per month, and those money you can see like in the majority of the people in the Cape Town and people. They don't earning that money, so that's why you see it's quite difficult for the people to live in Cape Town. So you end up seeing some people living out of the town, where in a township, because of like they don't have kind of money to pay off the uh, the uh, the bill for the accommodation. Mm. Yeah, that's the worst things in Cape Town. But otherwise, Cape Town, any kind of job you do, you can still making a living. Yeah, but. Um, uh, fortunately, Cape Town is getting more expensive. Yeah, yeah, I can I can feel that as well. And at the moment, I'm looking for a place to stay, and I can totally see that it's it's it, the prices have gone up. Where, where where do you live yourself? Uh, I live in a, in a, like a 15 minutes from Cape Town CBD, which is the called Goodwood side. So it's an apartment there. I'm paying five thousand. It's just yeah. small square bachelor, and you can imagine it's little man, and it's not even in the city. You know, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. This episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotels and guest houses and hostels around the world. Hotels25.com. Here I am on the street waiting for the next Uber. And I just want to make a complete disclaimer. I am not sponsored by Uber. And uh, I'm paying for these trips. And uh, this is not a commercial for Uber. But I am a fan of Uber, especially here in Cape Town. I've had a few bad experiences with the the normal taxis. One of them was when I came to the airport on this trip. I got into a taxi and I asked him how much would it be to take me to the city center and he said 250 uh, rand. And I said, well, okay. And then we started driving and he couldn't find his way. He got so lost several times and it took a lot longer and I was on the meter so I paid extra for that just because he couldn't find the way and I was not so happy about that. The second experience I had was when I was um, at a restaurant one night and I knew from experience that it would be 30 rand in in an Uber to take me to the apartment where I I live. And I I spoke to a taxi driver and he said 60 rand, so exactly the double. Uh, And I said, no, I know that an Uber is uh, 30 from here. And then he said, okay, I'll do it for 50. And I thought, yeah, instead of ordering an Uber and waiting for it, let me get into this taxi. It was right here and 30 or 50, whatever. I got into the taxi. He drove me home. And then in my wallet, I had a 100 Rand bill and I had 30 Rand. So I gave him the 100 Rand and expected him to give me 50 back. And he didn't have change for that. So 
uh, I said, oh, take the 30 then. It's not my responsibility that you can't, uh, you don't have change. Uh, but he instead, he, he kept my 100 uh, Rand bill and then turned the taxi and drove all the way back to where we came from because there was a, uh, a gas station right there. And then he went and changed the, uh, the 100 Rand bill and took me home and I was fuming with anger i was not pleased with that and i told him that is exactly one of the reasons i don't drive taxi i only use uber uh, here in cape town so that is just a quick explanation why this episode is not called something with taxi drivers i'm sure there are a lot of uh, honest good hard-working taxi drivers here in cape town and i don't want to put those down i just had a couple of bad experiences and that's why i use uber i pay with the app so i don't have to worry about change and I put the address in so they know exactly where I'm going. And it's a fixed price no matter if I get stuck in traffic. It's always the price that's in the app. So I know what I'm dealing with. So, yeah, if the taxi companies here in Cape Town would have sort of the same system with an app where I can pay with the app and I put the address in, I would use that just as much, especially if it's around the same price. I don't have anything against taxi drivers, I, I, I'm sure, and I am not sponsored by Uber. So so I just want to put that out there. My next driver is called, well, he better say it himself. Faisal Cochlin. Oh, that's a good name. <laughs> are, you, yeah. are, you, are you from Cape Town? Yeah, born and bred in Cape Town. When I ask him about the best part about living in Cape Town, he says the people. Cape Town's people are very relaxed. And... Um, they're not as violent as... Uh, Johannesburg, for instance. Although there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of crime in the the, um, the local townships, but generally in Cape Town itself, um, it's uh, people are very very kind towards each other because um, we used to have a place called District Six where everybody lived together. And because of the government that um, try to get uh, segregation in motion by splitting up the people, uh, they had to move out of town. Yeah. And they were placed in various places on the outskirts of Cape Town. And because of that, um, yeah, you, um, they developed a lot of poverty and unemployment. So basically, the crime because of the of um, the lack of work, the youngsters are resort to crime, and that's why um, it is what it is at the moment. The thing about District Six is something we'll talk more about in the second half of this episode when I visit the District Six Museum. But before that, let's get back in the last Uber in this episode. It's a Volkswagen Polo, but the guy behind the wheel is called Audi. Here I am with Audi in a Polo. <laughs> yeah, that's me, yeah? Your name is Audi. Yes, that's it's, right. it's your real name. Yeah, Audi, that's my real name, yeah. Yeah, hmm. yeah and uh, your parents like cars? Yeah, absolutely not. Not my parents doesn't like a car, you know, but the, my, grand, my grandfather, that, you know, when I was a little one, so he decided, like, you know, let me give you, like, the name of Audi. Yeah. And, you, and you like it? Absolutely, I it's like it. It's a cool it. name. Yeah, it is a cool yeah. name. Then, yeah. you know? Lots of clients in our Uber drive, like, in Uber business, like, they loving it most. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are, you, are you born and raised in, in, in South Africa, or are you from somewhere else? No, nah, absolutely. I'm a true Malawian. Then. Malawian? Yeah, okay. I'm a true Malawian. When, when did you get here? No, that was, like... 10 years, 10 years ago. Yeah. What was the reason you traveled here? No, the reason to travel to, to South Africa, you know, like now what I'm doing, I came here because I had my idea, you know, so that I should travel. So I traveled to Cape Town, so my spending time in Cape Town just to do Ubering now. Yeah. Mm. So you came, you came here to, because there was a better chance of getting work? No, that's, that's, that wasn't the case. Even back home in Malawi, there is also a chance of getting work. But it was a part of, you know, learning. You know, it was a part of learning. So I got in, in uh, Cape Town, I'm learning in Cape Town. 
now I'm doing it uh, Ubering, you know, so it wasn't that bad looking for work, you know. No. Hmm. So what, what, do you, what do you like about uh, being here? What's good about Cape Town? No, here there is a lot of advantage that, you know, we, we can do. You know, as a man, you need to hustle. So I'm hustling in, here in Cape Town. Here is where everything that I can see that I want is, is, is here in Cape Town, anyway. Yeah. And you got family here? Yes, I got a family as well. Yeah. Mm. So you're not planning on going back to Malawi? No, home is the best. You know, I do tell to the clients that if you ask someone asking me how is the Malawi, do you want to go back to Malawi? I do tell them that, you know, Malawi, that's the, you know, that's the home, that's the, my home. So I always think to go back to Malawi. Yeah, a big part of your heart is still there. Yeah, sure. Uh, my feeling is there in Malawi. Yeah, yeah. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. My name is Palabo. We'll be right back. Before we continue, I'd like to mention another podcast that you might like. It's called Far From Home, and it's produced by a very experienced radio producer, Scott Gurian from New York. The first season of Far From Home was 24 episodes from when he did the Mongolian rally with his brother. They drove 11,000 miles, almost 18,000 kilometers from London to Mongolia in a tiny old Nissan Micra that broke down all the time. Here's a clip from that season when they were in Turkmenistan. We'd been driving through the wilderness with rolling hills and mountains that extended as far as we could see in all directions, when suddenly we rounded a corner and saw the skyline of Ashgabat, Turkmenistan's capital city, off in the distance. That's impressive. We followed the road down from the mountain, drove through the city's ceremonial gate, and entered its outskirts. And it immediately seemed different from anywhere else we'd ever been. I was trying to figure out just what it was about this place, but Drew put his finger on it pretty quickly. (laughs) Everything is white. It's horrible. That's true. I hadn't thought of that. He was describing the mile after monotonous mile of grandiose government buildings and nearly identical looking apartment blocks made of white marble imported from Italy. Our guidebook had described Ashgabat as a cross between Las Vegas and Pyongyang, and we thought that seemed about right. It looks like the city is brand new and has never been touched. Yeah, basically. Like we're the first people to drive on these newly opened roads. Pretty much. It looks like the city just opened for business. (laughs) Seriously, where is everybody? So confused. It was just a few minutes later, as we approached an empty intersection, that we were flagged to the side. Is he pulling us over? a cop in the middle directing traffic. I think he's pulled us over. We weren't speeding, and we couldn't figure out what we had done wrong, aside from driving ridiculous-looking rally cars with foreign plates. But maybe that was enough. The cop approached Rosie and Jane's car, since it was in the lead. He didn't write a ticket or seem like he was scolding us in any way. Instead, he simply held us there for several minutes, sort of engaging in small talk, but he didn't speak any English, and we couldn't understand any Turkmen, so we had no idea what he said. It's almost like he was stalling time while he listened to someone talking to him in some sort of earpiece. And then, this part is still hard to believe, but more cars suddenly started appearing on the roads around us, almost like actors walking on stage late for the performance, and he let us continue on our way. Looking back later on, we all tried to figure it out, but we couldn't quite shake the crazy feeling that we were in some sort of real-life Truman show, where Jim Carrey's character realized that everything was a facade, a show being put on just for him, and everyone around him seemed to somehow be in on it. Maybe I'm losing my mind, but... It feels like the whole world revolves around me somehow. If you like the Radio Vagabond just a little bit, I highly recommend that you listen to Far From Home. I think you're going to love it. Now, back to Cape Town. District 6 is a former inner-city residential area in Cape Town. By the turn of the century, it was already a lively community. It was home to almost a tenth of the population of the city of Cape Town. After World War II, during the earlier part of the apartheid era, whites, blacks and colored living together in peace and harmony, 
many Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Portuguese, Indian, Chinese, you name it, they were all here. According to one of the former residents I spoke to at the District 6 Museum, they were one big happy family. They were all living proof that it can work living in peace side by side. But the apartheid regime didn't like that. At the District 6 Museum, when I was given a tour, I was shown a picture of this part of Cape Town that was taken back then. If you look at this board here, now up until the 19th century, Cape Town was very small. Contained, the people started sitting here from all over the world. City started growing here, more houses, more shops, whatever, okay? That's your map of Cape Town. And you were actually around here. Now, on the other side, that's your ugly story. Segregated city, okay? What these people, people actually wanted to do is, all along the beachfront, coastline, near the base beaches, places of work, shopping malls, transport for white people, okay? We actually got all the rocky beaches. Can you imagine you swim in a harbor area with water, all sorts of water that your beach? And a couple of meters from there, there was a pool. Board at the pool, Europeans only, if I was found swimming in that pool in apartheid days, I would probably go to jail for swimming. Sick, crazy, which we didn't, never wanted. On February 11th, 1966, the apartheid regime declared District 6 a whites-only area, and they started removing the people and leveling the houses. The people were moved to what was called Cape Flatlands, at least 20 to 30 kilometers outside of the city center. At the time, it was in the middle of nowhere and totally undeveloped. See the mountains at the back? The Cape Flats. Sandy ways of the Cape Flats, plus minus 30 kilometers from here. Can you imagine when people lived here? Most of us worked in and around the city. It took you 20 minutes to walk to work, 20 minutes to walk over. Cape Flats. Besides getting up early in the morning, sometime before dawn, one and a half hours plus traveling in the morning, one and a half hours at night, pay more for, the, for transport. Not only did they get longer transport time from home to work, it also meant extra cost for them without any increase in their pay. And the houses they lived in were not good. And then the house that they gave you was so horrible. You couldn't even move around that house. You know, in summertime, when the wind blows, the place will be full of sand forever. In winter time, you do not even want to sleep at night. So cold, crazy. Those houses were so small, you couldn't even change your mind inside the house. <laughs> Little look your furniture. <laughs> the people of color who owned their houses in District 6 got offered well below market value for the property. And if they refused to sell, then the regime would just take the property and give them what they thought it was worth, which was even less. Almost 70,000 of the inhabitants of District 6 were forcibly removed during the next 10 years. They not only moved the people, they tore the community apart and put them individually in different places. So everything that was community-based was also destroyed. The schools, the sports clubs, the churches, Everything that was community-based was destroyed. They even split up families. There was a family where the father was colored and the mother was black. They had three little kids that also were black. So the mother and the kids were moved to a township called Langa and the father to a different area. And they were not allowed to see each other. If he wanted to visit his wife and kids, he had to go to the police and get a permit. And if he got that, it would only be a few hours every three months. One of the men working at the District 6 Museum I spoke with used to live there. He's around 65 now, so just a boy when his family was removed. He remembers that day in February 66 very well. I used to go face the newspaper for my dad when he came from work. That night, I brought him the paper. Front page. Mm -hmm. My dad used to read that paper from front to back, from back to front, and then he was, I tell you, when do we get the paper? That night, he never read it. 
Mm. You look at it, cramped up like I said, bring me the dirt one. This goes in there, over my dead body. I'm not going. You can do what I like. Now, a lot of people refuse to go, right? If you don't go, they take your furniture out of your house, put it on the pavement. Now you've got to go look out for yourselves. These people are totally crazy. So I remember it very well. I remember the bulldozers came, saw all the things that happened, guys running around, taunting the police. They had to run for their lives. I remember when some of the riots took place in those days, but people only protested. They shot two of our youngsters in the back. He told me that a friend of his had a father who just couldn't understand and accept what happened. One day, he walked out the door, and a few days later, they found him hanging from a tree. And that was just one of many suicides after the removal. Many people also died of a broken heart. Many people died of broken hearts. I remember my father was, he was about in his early 60s when he had to leave his home. And I remember how my father cried because he didn't want to go, because this is his, was his home. This was from a documentary I found on YouTube, and this is from my visit to the museum. So I remember it very well. I remember the bulldozers came, saw all the things that happened, guys running around, taunting the police, they had to run for their lives. Well, what, what, what happened to your dad? Did, did, did he then go? He said, I refuse to go. But he was forced to go. Was he carrying out? What, what? They take your furniture out. Yeah. Put your furniture on outside. Now they tell you, now you can go and look out for yourselves. Because what they did, you get a, a notice letter, right? Ponte mm-hmm. Hill or Manenberg or Hanover Park, there's your key. Mm-hmm. And like I said, some people, if you don't go, they take your furniture out now. They, they don't care where you go, but you must get out of here. That, that was the norm. Today, most of what was then a uh, vibrant part of Cape Town with art, corner shops, markets and people of all color are mostly wasteland. Now, as the city has grown, it's quite central in the city, but no one builds on it. To say it's become a bit of a hot potato is probably an understatement. You can't build houses. It's going to cause chaos, right? There were still court cases pending for property. There was protest marches. It's going to cause chaos. And by the time that they woke up, the ANC government took over. Everything was just left. So everybody was allowed to claim. When the restitution is ever going to happen, I don't know. In the District 6 Museum, there's a big map of what the area used to look like on the floor. Also, you can see a lot of photos from then and now, and a lot of street signs that were given to the museum by some of the people who were a part of the demolition squad. District 6 Museum is absolutely a must when you visit Cape Town. In the next episode, we'll also hear some heartbreaking stories. This time it's from a German called Florian, who has set up and runs an orphanage in a township area. There's a weird, weird habit that these people here have. Um, When a girl is raped, when a child is raped at three, four, five years of age, doesn't matter. What they do is they take the child, the victim, and they immediately send her 1,500 kilometers to the north into the trans sky. They do not remove the perpetrator because he's a family member. And they say, he's a man of our family. We need to protect him. We need to do this. We need to do that. So think about it. A girl at four first gets raped by a person that she knows from the family and immediately after that she is sent away from the mother into a different setting, different surrounding, different whatever. She feels like she's being punished. Florian does amazing work with these kids. One of them is around music. They have a choir and they tour around the world. I was lucky enough to be there as they were rehearsing. And in the next episode, you can join me to a private little concert. And I'm so looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to Friday, where you get another interview with a traveler. This time, it's my good friend, Sean Tierney. 
He's also a podcaster, he's a traveler, and we sat down recently when I was in Bali and did two interviews. I interviewed him about his life and how he travels for this podcast, and he interviewed me for his podcast, The Nomad Podcast. And both episodes will come out in each our podcast feed this coming Friday. Produced by radioguru.co.uk and supported in part by Hotels25.com. My name is Palapo. See ya.